Russia's economy is teetering, battered by slumping oil prices and international sanctions. Joining us now for what looms next on the country's economic and political horizon. In Washington, D.C. via Skype, Angela Stent, director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian-European Studies, author of The Limits of Partnership, U.S.-Russian Relations in the 21st Century. And with us here in studio, we welcome back Brian Milner, the senior economics writer and global markets columnist at the Globe and Mail. And uh, Angela Stantz, great to have you back on the program. You were on with us not too long ago, and we're so glad you could make time for us again tonight. I'm delighted to be on. I want to just review, remind everybody where we were at the beginning of the program with the price of oil, what's been happening over the last half year or so. If you look at Brent crude, if you look at Western Texas Intermediate, if you look at Western Canada Select, the prices from a half a year ago to December to the most recent figures are all going down, down, down by dramatic amounts in ways that virtually no, nobody would have forecast a year or so ago. These figures, of course, all expressed in Canadian figures. Now let's look at what happens in Russia. Oil and gas make up 68% of Russia's exports. Revenues from oil and gas exports make up roughly 50% of the Russian government's revenues hugely dependent on this sector. In 2014, Russia's parliament approved a three-year budget that assumed an oil price of $100 a barrel from 2015 to 17. On the first day of 2014, the ruble was at 33.12 per U.S. dollar. Yesterday, it closed at 62.65 rubles per U.S. dollar. It's almost lost half its value. Angela, let me get you in here at this point. The Russian Central Bank's deputy chairman said last month, the situation is critical. We could not imagine this in our worst nightmare a year ago. That's his view. What's your view on the state of the Russian economy today because of all of this? Well, I think that's almost an understatement. So you have a perfect storm here. You have uh, collapsing oil prices, and then you have the effect of the sanctions that were imposed on Russia uh, because of the crisis in Ukraine. And that's had severe impact on the financial sector in Russia, very hard to get loans. Um, so that, and then with the, with the collapse of the ruble almost, uh, the Russian economy wasn't doing well before the Ukraine crisis began, but it's now in very, very serious condition. Um, and again, if oil prices now stay below $50, that's really pretty, pretty catastrophic for the Russians. Brian, would you say Russia is today in a recession? Oh, yeah, there no, there's no question about it. Uh, and, and they're going to stay there for a long time. I mean, even, even the Russian finance minister, who's supposed to have a relatively rosier view than international economists, says it's going to be about 4.5% negative in 2015. The economy will contract by 4.5%. That's right. Next year alone. Next year alone. This year alone. This, right, we're in 2015 and, uh, now, right. And, yeah. and, and we'll still be in recession in 2016, although the Russian, official Russian prediction is that it'll be less than 1%, but nobody thinks that's true. Hmm. Angela Sant, in your view, what kind of an impact are those sanctions that you just talked about having on the Russian economy? Well, I think the sanctions have had, I mean, in our wildest dreams, I think in the West, we didn't realize what an impact that would have because we didn't realize that oil prices were going to fall so precipitously. But they're having a very severe effect, again, in the financial sector. Now, Russia still has about maybe $200 billion in reserves, um, but they're using it now to prop up firms like Rosneft, the oil gi and giant, um, because they themselves can't get money from um, any other banks. So um, the sanctions have certainly had um, a very sharp impact on Russia economically. Um, and uh, you can see that also, it's also affected the value of the ruble. Obviously, what they haven't done is to change Russian policies. Right. But in terms of affecting the man and the woman in the street, as they say, in Russia, what kind of an impact are they having, those sanctions? Well, I think it, you have to differentiate between the sort of urban middle class people who are used to having consumer durables, who are used to buying, uh, you know, mascarpone cheese from Italy. Of course, Russia has now imposed its own sanctions on the import of Western foodstuffs. So for those people, it's really having quite a severe impact. I would say at the moment, for the people who live in the countryside, for the people who form the backbone of Putin's 80 percent of his popularity, so far they probably haven't felt that much the impact of the sanctions and the falling oil prices. But if this recession continues in 2015, I would think that they will as time goes on. Brian, your view on the impact on the people of these sanctions because of Ukraine? Well, well I agree that it's not affecting the, the most individuals because they're not big buyers of imported products, for one thing. Uh, they're not big borrowers from the banks, for another. 
Uh, and unemployment, uh, as bad as the Russian economy has been, unemployment is relatively stable. Uh, so they have jobs. What they don't have is income growth to deal with rising prices, which is going to happen. Uh, you know, the Central Bank of Russia now has now got an interest rate, a base interest rate of 17.5%. That makes it awfully tough for any normal human being to borrow any money. Uh, at the same time, the value of the ruble keeps shrinking, and people are live in total panic. And I think that panic is going to worsen of seeing all of their savings evaporate. You agree the sanctions are working? The sanctions, the financial sanctions are having a huge effect because it, it keeps the Russian companies out of the U.S. dollar market. I think the other sanctions on technology, on exports of certain products, except the oil industry ones, the ones that keep Canada from selling technology to the Russians, those are hurting. I think the other sanctions are not having a, a huge effect, but the financial sanctions are having an enormous effect. And there's no indication, really, that... Uh that's it for the sanctions, right? I mean, the longer Russia stays in Ukraine, there's every possibility there will be more sanctions ahead. Fair to say? More sanctions, and, and even if the situation stays stable, it's very hard to see those sanctions going off. For instance, the European Union sanctions will stay in place even if the Germans decide we don't want them anymore. They can't get rid of them because of the EU, the, the EU constitution, which means the EU itself has to decide whether those sanctions get lifted. Hmm. Angela Stent, sanctions, of course, are put in place by the West in the hopes that they will affect the behavior of Vladimir Putin. So far, it has not. And yet, you tell us about the significant impact it's having on the economy. How much more do you think the Russian people or Russian businesses and so on can stand before Putin does something? Well, they can probably stand more than we thought. I think there were maybe some misconceptions. I think in the beginning when the United States and the European Union sanctioned individuals that are close to Putin, uh, his cronies, if you like, uh, maybe there was a mistaken impression that they'd get together and say, wow, you know, we can't visit Europe anymore. We're losing money. Our bank accounts are frozen, whatever. Um, we need someone else in power. That's not how it works in Russia. Uh, and so that hasn't happened. Um, it's possible that as time goes on and if they feel the pinch more, um, there could be more pressure on Putin. The real question, again, will be for the people, again, who don't live in the big cities, in the countryside, who haven't felt the pinch yet. If they're, you know, Putin's compact with the people was, you, you know, you can't really say what you want to politically, but I guarantee you, your living standards will rise. And between 2000 and 2008, that certainly happened. Obviously, after the financial crisis, it was more complicated. But that pact is now threatened. If, people, if unemployment grows, for instance, or if people see that their um, standard of living is falling, um, if there's greater inflation, as we just heard about. So that could have some impact, but I think we should be very cautious in assuming that people are going to go out in the streets and demand a change in government. And then we also have to think what might come afterwards and what kind of a change this might produce. So I think we should be very modest in our expectations that so far these sanctions are going to produce some kind of regime change. Well, in fact, Angela, it's been quite the contrary. You say the social contract was lose some rights, but I'll make sure the economy is strong. The economy is not strong. And rather than throw the guy out, Putin's approval rating, last I saw, was north of 80 percent. How do you explain it's that? Well, because I think what Putin has done is clearly the annexation of Crimea um, touched some deep reserve of sort of feelings of humiliation and restored pride, if you like, in the Russian people. And it's not only the people out in the countryside who don't really have very much of an access to the Internet. It's among intellectuals. It's among professionals who somehow believe that Crimea really always was Russian and that an, an injustice had been righted. Um, so this appeal to patriotism. And then I think you have to understand that the Russian media are now spinning a story, are telling a story about what's happening in Ukraine that's 360 degrees different from the one that you would get in Canada, the United States, and Europe. So they're understanding of the facts is completely different from ours. And then the other thing is that the Kremlin, the Russian media are evoking the foreign enemy, that what's happened in Ukraine is all the fault of the United States, the, the Westerners, their, their secret services, and that we're all out to get Russia, that we're trying to uh, dismember Russia. I mean, Putin himself has said that. And then he said, and these foreign services have fifth columnists. They have agents within Russia that are doing their bidding. So I guess if you put all those together and you create this climate of fear, but also this climate of patriotic fervor, that keeps those numbers up. Now, the question again is, how long can you keep those numbers up 
if the economic situation really deteriorates. Well, Brian, one looks at history and you see that there's something in the DNA of the Russian people. They are able and have been able for a long time to withstand significant privations. Is today any different? Uh, well, I, I don't think it is in, in terms of the character of the, <coughs> the Russian people. They, they're, they're stoic. Uh, they've lived through horrible times in the past. Uh, and, and we saw what happened in World War II when their backs were to the wall and, and, and what they were able to accomplish. I, I think, though, that this time is different because they were promised things by, by Putin that he is not delivering and hasn't delivered for some time. Uh, the economy was in bad shape even before oil prices started dropping and the sanctions started biting. Uh, that's not getting better because Putin never reformed the economy. He never embraced an open capitalist system the way the Chinese did. He certainly didn't encourage any competition. And he made sure that his closest cronies all got rich. Uh, that does rankle, especially when people are starting to suffer. And the fact is that those cronies are not going to throw Putin to the wolves. They depend on him for the fortunes they've made. They're all old friends. They're either from the KGB days or from his days in St. Petersburg when he was basically running City Hall for the mayor. Uh, they owe him, and they're not going to abandon him, but that's a very small group of people. And it's shrinking all the time because Putin has lost the other oligarchs who weren't part of that circle. And, of course, that, they're the people who are moving money out of Russia and causing part of the problems for the ruble. You say, though, this time it's different. This time it's different, and therefore what? Well, I think it's, it's different in, in terms, first of all, I agree that Western expectations have been much too high, that, that Russia would never want to abandon these reforms, except people should realize that they never instituted any, really. Uh, it's, it's very much the old system, and, and Putin was relying on energy revenues, basically, to support social spending, to support all these investments in infrastructure that he had promised. Uh, and then he went and had the Sochi Olympics and, of course, blew a couple billion dollars of government money on that. But his friends got even richer from that. The average Russian didn't. Uh, but there was a lot of Russian pride. Uh, I think they spent, what they spent, 50 billion on the Sochi 50, Olympics? They spent about 50 billion Unbelievable. dollars. Unbelievable. Yeah. But there, were, there was a lot of Russian pride involved in that. So that sort of worked. That's why we didn't see the invasion of Crimea until right after the Olympics, right? Mm. Because then you've got, you've got this nationalism at a fever pitch. And, and the feeling, oh, we can accomplish anything. Uh, I think that Putin, as a leader, will be in trouble if this recession deepens and lasts much longer. And it could very well last even if oil prices start recovering. Angela, would you agree that he could be in trouble as a leader if this per persists? Yes, I think he could be in trouble. I mean, right now, um, they're scrambling trying to figure out what to do. Uh, it's a three-pronged strategy in terms of dealing with the population. Um, I mean, they basically encourage people who don't like what's going on to emigrate. And so you've seen a number, or at least leave Russia for a long time. You've seen a number of very prominent economists, um, intellectuals leave Russia. Uh, the idea is if you don't like what we're doing, get out. Uh, and then secondly, some people in, you know, opponents, let's say, democratic liberal opposition have been um, jailed. You know, they sit in prison now and there are more trials um, going on. Um, and then, you know, for the rest of them, it's feeding them this kind of patriotic fervor, this propaganda, and then also invoking the enemy. So that, that's the strategy so far. But um, I don't know how successfully that can be carried on for how long. Um, and I think you do have voices like the former finance minister, Alexei Kudrin, um, you know, very well respected in the West, who's come out several times now, and he, he's still doing it, saying, we shouldn't be isolated. We have to improve relations with the West. We've got to be integrated into the global economy, not moving away from it. And so um, as long as that, as that debate goes on, I think, you know, there may be some prospect um, of, of a somewhat more conciliatory political um, policy uh, toward the West, although it's very hard to see how that gets started at the moment, because otherwise the pressure on Putin domestically will grow. Have you, though, in your travels or through your studies, uh, seen many examples in Russia right now of social unrest or instability that you think ought to be of concern to Putin? 
I think at the moment, really no, um, because I guess, I guess he's he's bought off people again with the, with the patriotism, and frankly, the liberal opposition has more or less faded away. The crowd, the throngs of people who were out in the streets three years ago protesting against Putin, that movement's fizzled out, and its leader, Alexei Navalny, now um, his brother has been jailed instead of him. It's a kind of a hostage situation. But even um, you know, last week in the demonstrations to try and support him, very few people showed up. Admittedly, in minus. 20 degree weather. So I think um, at the moment um, there, there, there's not much of a, of a prospect of social unrest. But again, it can come back if unemployment grows, um, if inflation is such that people can't afford to buy the bare necessities. If that really begins to pinch them, then I think you could some, see some unrest. But in Russia, um, revolutions always occur in the big cities, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. Um, and so it really would require, uh, you know, some major mobilization there. And then the issue is, which groups would it be? And there are also, of course, the far right, the nationalists in Russia, who've been growing in strength now, in a way fueled by what's happened in Crimea and Ukraine. And that's another form of potential opposition to Putin that could be quite problematic for the outside world. Brian, can you help us understand how these oligarchs who have supported him for so long and who are taking a bath right now, why are they still so loyal to him throughout this whole piece? Well, they're taking a bath only in relative terms. You're talking about people who basically started with nothing and when the communist state fell apart, they were basically handed the keys to these assets. Uh, they were either KGB operatives or they were low, lower level civil servants or in some cases they were childhood friends. They weren't making huge money. Some of them were t actually teachers. Uh, they, they had relatively minor roles in, in government. Uh, they got very rich from getting their hands on these assets. Uh, and, you know, if a billionaire is only worth half of what he was two years ago, that's still pretty good. You're still doing pretty well, but if you're keeping score, you're going in the wrong direction. But if Putin goes, they go. And so they, they so really... So their fate is tied to him either way. Absolutely. I mean, there's a, Russian, there's a Russian joke that goes around that this is the year of 63. Putin turned 63, the oil price will be 63, and the ruble will be 63 to the U.S. dollar. Now, they're, they're wrong about oil. It's already lower. <laughs> but they're right about the ruble and certainly about Putin. <laughs> okay. Here is an excerpt from uh, Jeremy Shapiro's piece. Uh, he's a fellow at the Brookings Institute, and he did this last month. He says, many neo-cold warriors in the West are experiencing an almost hormonal level of schadenfreude and expecting the Russians to bow to economic reality in Ukraine. But having sacrificed the Russian economy on the altar of strategic independence, Russian leaders are unlikely to concede on core security issues simply because of a devastating currency crisis. Let me get some feedback on that. Angela, do you agree with that assessment? Well, I think, again, so far we can see that even though the sanctions and all the have hit um, Russia quite economically, have caused um, a number of economic problems, we haven't seen any concessions by the Kremlin. In fact, we've ha seen a stiffening of the resolve. So um, in some ways, uh, I think we all understand that, that there aren't going to be quick results from this. Um, but... Again, my understanding is that the situation, for instance, in eastern Ukraine is now such that Russia doesn't have complete control, for instance, over the separatists there, separatists there although it's supporting them. They now, they're getting disillusioned with Moscow because they want something else. You could actually have greater unrest there, and then you'd have to see, are the Russians really going to continue to support these groups there, or at some point, um, would they might think that it might be in, in their interest to sit down and have meaningful conversations with the West, uh, with the Ukrainians, obviously, and with the Europeans um, and other countries about trying to de-escalate the situation. Now, I'm not holding my breath on this, but I think one cannot rule it out. Brian, that word schadenfreude is a great word. <laughs> I mean, do you, is much of the world right now taking delight in Russia's misery? Well, I suspect they are uh, because uh, they, they haven't been happy with Putin for a long time. He hasn't, he hasn't met their expectations, but he's met his own. Uh, and I don't think, I think they've underestimated what those were and, and, and how effectively he's been able to take control of the reins of government. And, and it really is all in his hands. Uh, that was his plan all along and, and, his, and the cohorts who supported him. Uh, this is not something new. They were planning this when, uh, uh, in the last days of the Soviet government in the late 1980s. 
So this is a long-range plan. This is not something they cooked up two years ago. Uh, this was always the plan. Uh, naturally, they wanted a stronger economy to support their military adventures, and they certainly never saw what was going to happen to oil and gas coming. Uh, that hit them very hard, but they thought they could cover up all the cracks with that energy revenue, and obviously the cracks have widened, and they never diversified that economy because they didn't care about it. Uh, and that's come back to haunt them. Uh, we touched on this, Angela, a little earlier in the program before you joined us, but I'd like to get your take on it anyway. Uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, has not cut back production in an effort to raise the price of oil. In fact, they're still letting her rip, as they say. What's your view on how this uh, has had an impact on Russia and its economy? Well, I mean, the Russians, of course, are still saying that somehow the U.S. and the Saudis have collaborated, as they did in the late 1980s, so say the Russians, uh, to lower oil prices. That led to the collapse of the Soviet Union, and they think this is going to lead to the collapse of Russia. Um, now, uh, whether they believe that or not, uh, I, I'm not sure. But obviously, from the Russian point of view, um, you know, what the Saudis are doing is certainly not helpful for them. Uh, you, we, we may forget that a few years ago, Russia actually considered joining OPEC, and then decided that the, you know this would not make sense from their point of view, uh, wouldn't work out. So I, I think this has just maybe exacerbated uh, their view of the Saudis, which anyway has always been rather complex. Hmm. Brian, do you think there's anything to the to the notion that uh, this is the late 1980s all over again? The United States and Saudi Arabia are colluding to somehow bring an end to the Russian Empire. Well, I, I believe it serves uh, both their interests to to uh, not just to hurt the Russians, but to hurt the Iranians. Uh, and, and the fact is that when the Saudis did cut production, and OPEC cut as well in 2008, uh, the Russians promised to do the same, and they, and they broke their promise because they slipped into recession in 2009, and they, and they ramped up production. Uh, so the Saudis don't trust the Russians. The Russians said, you cut and we'll follow. The, the Saudis said, well, we've been down that road before, and you sure didn't do it last time. So there's a lot of mistrust between those governments. With just a few minutes left here, let me get one last issue on the table. And, and of course, th the world has a great interest in knowing whether, if the Russian economy continues to collapse, and if the pressure on Putin becomes somehow untenable, is it possible to imagine a better relationship between Russia and the West emerging from that scenario? Angela Stent, what do you say? Um, uh, rather difficult to imagine at the moment. Um, if we talk about the United, let's just talk about the United States now, and I would say it's very hard to imagine for the rest of the Obama administration that you could see an improved relationship with Russia, and there'll be nothing in it for the whoever runs as the two candidates for the 2016 election in the United States to adopt um, a more conciliatory attitude towards Russia. So I think relations are really broken, at least between the U.S. and Russia. They're as bad as they were, um, or worse, since before Gorbachev came to power, and it's going to take a very long time for anything to improve there. Hmm. So worst relations, you think, probably since the end of the Cold War. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, well, since before then. I mean, since Even before. when Gorbachev came to power, they were much better, actually. Hmm. Okay. Brian, your view on that? Well, well I agree. I, I don't see any easy way to improve relations when their interests are so diametrically opposed. And, and, and the Russians seem unwilling to participate with other powers in, in setting, settling a lot of problems, including Iran, including Syria, uh, and uh, including the energy issues. So, so they're really marching to their own drummer now, and they are more isolated than they have been before. The odd thing is, of course, that they've warmed up relations with China, hmm. uh, which is one positive followed, I guess, if you're looking for positive things. <laughs> the Chinese and the Russians are talking again. Uh, but in terms of Washington, uh, Washington will gain nothing by having warmer relations with Moscow as long as Putin is in power. Hmm. I want to thank Angela Stent, who was there for us in Washington, D.C. She is the director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian, and East European Studies at Georgetown University, and we would recommend heartily The Limits of Partnership, U.S.-Russian Relations in the 21st Century. Angela, always good of you to join us on TVO. Thanks so much. Hey, thank you. And to Brian Milner, of course, our good friend from the Globe and Mail, the writer and uh, global markets columnist. Brian, great to see you again as well. My pleasure. Thanks. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.